Okay, so next we're going to talk about another way of thinking about causal inference um, that is most commonly seen in the social sciences, specifically in economics and econometrics, which we'll be looking at um, throughout the rest of the semester. Um, you'll also see the same notation and the same approach in the World Bank um, Impact Evaluation book and in the causal inference mixtape and in mastering metrics. Um, it's all over the place. And so it's important to talk about this. Um, but it's also connected to DAGs. Um, and so it, it's not a separate thing. It's just kind of a, a different way of, of looking at um, these causal relationships. And so first, um, before we talk about potential outcomes, I want to review quickly um, the idea of program effect. We talked about this in the last session as well. Um, where what we're most interested in, in this class, and in any causal inference um, situation, is our main goal is to find this number right here. This is the lowercase um, letter D in Greek, or delta. This is what we care about, which is the program effect here. So we have X, which is the program. We have Y, which is the outcome. So when we're talking about the effect of X on Y, this is given that you do x, if we're using do calculus language and the do operator language. So if somebody goes through this box here, does this box, then they'll have some sort of outcome. If they don't do this box, they'll have some other sort of outcome. And that difference right here between what would have happened with the program and what actually did happen with the program, that right there is our program effect, or the delta. Um, and so that, that's this relationship between x and y and what delta is here, the thing we're actually trying to measure. Um, where this gets confusing is there are lots of different ways of writing this using equations. And you'll see these all over the place. There are different ways of writing this. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to all of them, or different ones. This still isn't all of them, just a whole bunch of different ones. Um, so one way of looking at this, again, d or delta here is the main thing we care about. That's the causal effect which is this difference here, what would have happened without the program versus what happened with the program. So one way of writing it is it's the probability distribution of y given that you do x. And this is the do operator language that we talked about in the last um, section for today. Um, you could also write it like this. Um, you could say the expected value or the expectation of doing x on y minus the expected value of doing or of not doing x on y. So you can negate this do by putting a hat on it so that we can read that as not doing. Um, this right here is, is essentially the same thing as this. Because you're saying what is the effect of doing the program and what is the effect of not doing the program. Subtract those and you have the program effect. Um, so that, that's how you'd write it with the do operator. In the potential outcomes world, they don't use the do operator, um, but they do kind of. They just don't call it do. Um, they would write it like this. You would say, what is um, e, or what is y here? What is the outcome? Given that x equals 1, which means the program equals true, you do the program, minus the outcome given that x equals 0 or that you don't do the program. This is the same thing. This just has the do built into it. This is assuming that you do the program, but it's, it's the same thing. Um, as kind of a shortcut version of this, you could also write it like this. And so you're saying the program effect or the causal effect is the outcome if you do the program with the subscript 1 minus the outcome if you don't do the program, which is the subscript 0 here. So th these all mean the same thing. Um, it's just different ways of writing that gap between what would have happened and what did happen. Um, the tricky part about this, though, is in lots of these situations, it is impossible to measure this not to do X thing or the outcome if you don't do the program. Um, this is why I had you listen to the first part of this podcast here from This American Life. Um, what was fascinating was that they made this app that uses fancy quantum physics in like a lab in CERN um, to split reality into a different timeline um, so that you can kind of choose the best option. Um, and so it, it's kind of a gimmicky way of thinking about multiple timelines. Um, so let's say you're interested in participating in some sort of program that may boost your income and may not. Um, if you could somehow have one person be the same person but split their timelines and then measure what happens as a result, that would be really cool. You could measure the exact delta for one specific person. 
Um, and so the whole podcast was just kind of stories about that same idea. Um, they never talked about deltas, um, but that is what they're talking about, is that difference between what would have happened and what did happen in a specific person. Um, the tricky part about this for the potential outcomes world and for causal inference in general is something called the fundamental problem of causal inference. This is at the core of everything we're doing in this class. Um, ideally, we want to measure this thing. We want to know, so notice how there's a subscript here, this I. This means we want to know the individual delta, the individual effect for a person, um, for somebody's outcome if they do a program minus somebody's outcome if they don't do the program. Um, in real life though, this is what the formula looks like. We see somebody, they do the program, and we have no clue what it would look like if they didn't do the program or vice versa. It could be that somebody didn't participate in the program. We know what their outcome is, but we have no idea what this is. We don't know what would have happened had they done the program. And so as a result, the whole fundamental problem of causal inference, the main issue with everything we're doing in this class, is that it is impossible to measure or to observe individual level effects unless we had a time machine. Um, and then we could see kind of what happens when people are in parallel paths. Um, there's no way to know what both of these numbers are simultaneously. Um, there's no way of looking at the counterfactual world. Um, and so we can't know if a specific program would cause a specific individual to have some sort of effect. That's impossible. So the solution to this fundamental problem of causal inference in this class and in the whole potential outcomes framework is this thing called average treatment effects. For the rest of the class, this is the whole goal of all of the fancy regression models that we'll be running. We want to find the average treatment effect of a program or an intervention or a policy or something um, on an outcome. So the reason this works and kind of fixes the fundamental problem of causal inference is that we're no longer looking at individual, um, individual level effects. We're looking at group effects. We're looking at the average of everybody's individual effects. And then that lets us get at kind of the average overall effect for the whole population. Um, you can write this different ways. This is um, kind of the, the official mathy explanation for it, where you have the average treatment effect is equal to the expected value of if you do the, the outcome if you do the program minus the outcome if you don't do the program. Um, through the distributive property, we can rewrite this as just the expected value for people who do the program minus the expected value for people who don't do the program. Um, if we think about it kind of in a more do operator language, um, it's the difference um, between the average outcome when the program is on minus the average outcome when the program is off. And so, or you could write this as do P and not do P. Um, but that's, that's what we're looking at here is we want to figure out the average outcome for people in the program minus average outcome for people not in the program. That's going to be our average treatment effect. The tricky part here and the issue that we see throughout all of the different approaches that we'll be looking at is that this doesn't exactly work all the time. If you're only looking at people who do a program and don't do a program, there's going to be a ton of selection bias in there. People are going to willingly choose to do a program because they think it's going to be beneficial, and so they'll have a bigger effect than people who choose not to do the program. Um, and so you can't just look at... Um, averages across groups of people in the program, people not in the program, it's not going to give you the right number because it has selection bias built into it. Um, so to show you what this looks like, we're going to use a toy example here, an, a data set with eight rows in it, and we'll look at different types of treatment effects that we can measure using this fake data set and what is actually happening when we're talking about average treatment effects from observational data. So here's our fake data set. It has eight different people in it. Um, four of them are old. Four of them are young. Three of the old people did the program, and one did not. And then one of the young people did the program, and three did not. I have no idea what the program is. doesn't matter. Just pretend it's something. Um, in this data set, we have a time machine, and we can read people's minds, and we know what would have happened, or what, what would happen to them if they did the program, and what would happen to them if they didn't do the program. And then we can see the actual causal effect. So this is the, the causal effect of this program on person one is 20. It boosts whatever their outcome is. If that's dollars, if that's years of life, I don't know. It's something. 
Um, doesn't matter what the actual thing is. This is just saying because this person went through the program, it caused them to live 20 years longer, to earn 20 more dollars or, or something. Um, we'll pretend this is lifespan just for this example. So this person lived 20 years longer because of this program. Neat. This one individual, person two, in the absence of the program, they would have lived 70 years. Because of the program, they lived 75 years. And so the effect is five. These causal effects don't always have to be positive either. So if you look at person seven here, um, without the program, they would live to 100. With the program, they would live to 90. And so they ended up not doing the program. Um, they were not treated. And so um, that's good for them because the causal effect would have been negative 10. Um, and so that wouldn't have been great for them. So if we want to figure out the average treatment effect for all of these individuals, what we do is we take the average of this column here. So these eight rows, we add those numbers up and divide by eight because there are eight rows here. And what that leaves us with is five. So the average effect of this program is that it causes people to live on average five years longer. Some people live longer. Some people live less longer if they were involved in the program, but they purposely didn't because maybe they saw that that would hurt them and so they didn't. And so that is what the average treatment effect is. It's this column here, where it's just the average of everybody's individual level causal effects. Um, again, we can only calculate this directly right now because this is fake data that we made up and because we can read people's minds and so we can see what the causal effect would be. Um, but in real life, we can't actually measure that. And we'll show different ways of getting at that in a minute. Um, the average treatment effect is not the only thing we can measure. Um, we can also measure something called the Kate or the conditional average treatment effect, which is the average treatment effect for specific subgroups. Um, and so this lets us answer the question, is the program more effective for specific age groups? Um, so we can look at the program effect just for old people and just for young people, for instance. So if we do that, we're left with um, this situation here. Um, if we want to know the conditional average treatment effect for old people, we only look at the old people and we figure out um, the outcome with program and the outcome without the program. Um, or we figure out the average treatment effect uh, for people in that program there. And so um, if we look here, this is 20 plus 5 plus 5 plus 10. That is what the individual causal effects would be. Um, divide that by four because that's there are four people in that group. And so the average treatment effect for old people is 10. If we just look at young people here, um, we have five, zero, negative 10 and five, add those together, divide by four, we're left with zero. So on average, this program does not do anything for young people, um, but it really, really helps old people live longer on average 10 years. And so that is how we find the conditional average treatment effect. Um, another version of this treatment effect um, uh, value that we can find, there are two that we will see a lot in the upcoming sessions. Um, we have the average treatment on the treated effect, which is the effect for just those who got treatment. Um, you'll see this written as ATT or TOT. This is average treatment effect or treatment on the treated. Um, you can also look at the average treatment on the untreated or the ATU or the TUT treatment on the untreated or average treatment on the untreated. This is the effect for those without treatment. While that sounds complicated, it's the same thing that we did with old and young. It's really just the conditional average treatment effect, but just for um, people who got treatment and people who didn't get treatment. So if we look at our table again, um, if we want to find the conditional average treatment effect for treated people, we need to look at just the treated people, um, which means we're looking at person one, two, three, and five. So we add their individual effects, 20 plus five plus five plus five, divide by four. So for treated people, the conditional average treatment effect is 8.75 extra years. Um, for untreated people, so that's gonna be the conditional treatment effect for the people who did not get treatment. So that's person four, six, seven, and eight. We look at their individual level causal effects, which are 10, negative 10, zero, negative 10, and five. Um, if we take the average of that, we're left with 1.25.
And so that is the effect of the program on untreated people. Um, so that those are two other conditional average treatment effects that we can figure out. Um, the reason this matters, like we can figure out any sort of conditional average treatment effect. If we had another column that said like state, we could figure out the conditional average treatment effect for different states, for whatever variable we want. Whatever subgroups we want, we can figure out the Kate for it. Um, but why this is important specifically for treatment effects is this right here. We can combine these to figure out the average treatment effect. So the actual average treatment effect mathematically is a combination of the average treatment on the treated and the average treatment on the untreated. And we can combine the two to figure out the average treatment effect. So here's what that looks like mathematically. The official formula is, um, notice that this pi sign, this gets confusing. That is not 3.14. Um, econometricians use that to stand for proportion. Um, they do that because it's um, different from P. If they use P, that generally means probability. We've been seeing that in other formulas where we say the probability distribution of Y, given that you do X, that P is special for probability. This P here means proportion. So what we're going to do is find the proportion of people who are treated, multiply that by the average treatment effect, find the proportion of people who are not treated, multiply that by the um, average, or average treatment on the untreated, if we combine those, what we're left in the end with is the average treatment effect. And we see this. Um, if you remember from this slide right here, um, our average treatment effect and our, let's put me away here. Um, so our average treatment effect is 8.75. Our, our average treatment on the treated effect, the ATT is 8.75. The ATU is 1.25. And if you remember from this slide back here, the average, not the that Kate, but this Kate, this average treatment effect, that is five. That is the true average treatment effect. So if we only know the treatment effect or the, the effect of the program on the treated and the effect of the tr uh, program on the untreated, we can use math to combine them and it gives us that average treatment effect, which is pretty cool. Um, and we'll see why this matters once we get to situations where we can't actually measure these things directly. Because um, so far, we've been able to get that 5, and we've been able to get the 8.75 and the 0 0.625. Um, we've been able to get that because we have a time machine, and we can read individual level causal effects. But in real life, we can't. Um, but the same formula here, where we're combining the treatment on the treated and treatment on the untreated, um, if we do, if we find those things, we can combine them to figure out the actual tr average treatment effect um, as close as possible without a time machine. Um, this, the same math formula here, looking at the average treatment effect, um, shows us selection bias uh, built into an equation here. So if you remember, if we could only find um, like this, eight point seven five is the effect of the program on treated people. Um, this is the same thing, like this effect of the program on untreated people. That is also our selection bias. And so if we use algebra here, we can see um, that the selection bias from this situation um, is negative 3.75 years. And so um, that's like built into the formula. You can figure it out again if you can read people's minds. Um, that's where the selection bias is coming from. If you're running some sort of randomized controlled trial and you can randomly assign who gets stuff, um, that fixes this and makes this x essentially zero. Um, which, if we think again about DAGs, um, when we intervene in a DAG and we do x, we get to delete all of the arrows coming into that node, and that gets rid of any confounding. So confounding causes selection bias. Collision or colliders cause selection bias. There are other issues that cause selection bias. But if we can randomly assign the program, and if we can have like a randomized controlled trial, then that selection bias um, goes away graphically and mathematically. Um, so why this matters um, is because in real life, this is what the data set would look like. We don't have a column showing their outcome if they did the program and their outcome if they didn't do the program so that we can see their individual level causal effect. All we see is this. This is the actual outcome. This is what they did. Um, this is that same data set. This is just um, instead of having those those two columns saying what would happen if they were treated or not treated, this just shows what happened. They were treated, so they get this number. They were not treated, so they get this number. 
So how do we find that average treatment effect if we don't have that column? We, we don't have our individual level causal effect column anymore. Um, so how do we fix it? Um, there are a bunch of different ways. We can think about it with DAGs. Um, in this situation, it looks like age is kind of confounding both of these things. Um, if you look at treatment, most of the people who were treated were old, and most of the people who weren't treated are young. So I'm guessing there's an age node in there that is causing treatment. Um, and age is causing outcome as well. And so we want to do something statistically with age. Uh, we can control for it, we can adjust for it, we can do something with it. Um, so one way of doing this, um, again, there's a, lots of different ways of, of working with adjustment, and we'll talk more about this in a couple of weeks when we talk about regression um, and matching and inverse probability weighting. Um, what we can do here is find the conditional average treatment effects based on age, because that's one of the confounders here. And so what we can do is if we calculate the conditional average treatment effect for old people and the conditional average treatment effect for young people, because age is one of our confounders there, um, and it's, it looks like it's helping to assign treatment um, because it's very, uh, age is very closely related to treatment, um, if we can figure out those two parts here, the, the effect of the, or the average um, program effect on old people, the average program effect on young people, then we can figure out the estimated average treatment effect. Notice how these things have hats on them now. Um, that's because that's estimated. We can't read people's minds. We're just guessing. The hat is just a sign that we're guessing. Um, another core part of this is this fun assumption right here this assumption of unconfoundedness. Um, this formula here, figuring out the conditional average treatment effect of old people, adding that to the conditional average treatment effect of young people, calling that the average treatment effect, that works only if we can make this assumption here, which is that treatment within these groups is random. So we know that like old people are purposely more likely to choose treatment um, and young people are not. But the unconfoundedness part says, among old people, three of these people got treatment, that person didn't. So we, if we can assume that person four didn't get it just because of chance, and maybe they would have gotten it, and person three wouldn't have gotten it, and it was just kind of up to randomness, if we can make that assumption that the assignment of the treatment within the groups is random, then this equation right here will be true. So the same thing is true for the young people. If you notice here, one of them got the treatment and the other three did not. And so if we can assume that that one person kind of accidentally did it, or um, maybe person seven would have and they didn't, or person five might not have, but they woke up on the right side of the bed that morning, so they did it. Um, if we can assume that that person was randomly selected, randomly chose to do it within that group, then this formula right here is going to be true. Um, so it all, it's all based on that assumption right there, this unconfoundedness assumption. Your job in any report that you write using this, this average treatment effect and conditional average treatment effect um, is you have to justify why it's unconfounded. And you have to spend a couple sentences saying, I believe this is unconfounded within the groups because of reasons. Um, and you have to justify that. There's no statistical way of figuring that out. You just have to tell a good story about it. So what this looks like then is this. It's a, this is kind of scary looking. Um, I'll move me temporarily so you can see the final answer is going to be 4.1. Um, we'll walk through all of the different parts here. So this is the main thing we care about here. Again, we're trying to find the average treatment effect, and all we have are, are observed outcomes. We don't know what's going on in people's heads. But if we assume unconfoundedness, then we can figure out average treatment effect by finding the conditional treatment effect for old people, the conditional treatment effect for young people, and combining them. So the conditional treatment effect for old people is going to be the, the, the average treatment effect for treated minus the average treatment effect for untreated. So if you look at this, 80 plus 75 plus 85, that's coming from our old treated people. So there's our 80, there's our 75, and there's our 85. So we take the average of that, so 80 plus 75 plus 85 is some number. Divide that by three, it's some number. Um, 
we, I think it's 80, because then we can subtract 60 divided by one, because it's just one person who is old who didn't get the treatment. And so that leaves us with 20. That is the conditional average treatment effect for old people. We can do the same thing for young people. We figure out the, just looking at the young group, we figure out the effect for people who went through the treatment, so 75, minus this average here, 80 plus 100 plus 80 is some number divided by three. Um, if we do 75 minus whatever that is, we're left with 11.6667. So with these two parts, we can now plug it into this bigger equation here and figure out what the average treatment effect is. Um, so let's move me out of the way here so you can see. Um, so the official equation here, we have the 20. That's the conditional average treatment effect for old people. We have the negative 11, which is the conditional average treatment effect for young people. Four eight, or four eighths, that is the proportion of old people in our data set. We have four out of the eight. And same thing with young people. We have four eighths um, because these are those four out of the eight. So if we go through and multiply all of this together, we're left with 4.16666667 as our official average treatment effect. That is not quite five. Um, the true average treatment effect that we saw when, once we could read everybody's minds was five. Um, and we know that that is kind of the truth underneath all of this stuff, but we have no way of actually measuring that. So the fact that we have 4.166 is pretty cool. That's close to five. It's not like 19 or zero, um, it's close. And we got close because we used this conditional average treatment effect or combining them using one of the nodes in our DAG that helped assign treatment um, because age seemed to cause treatment and seemed to cause the outcome. And so this is one way of adjusting for age. And then we were able to get our estimated average treatment effect. It is very, very tempting to do something like this when you're trying to find a causal effect. This does not work. This is, you figure out the, the conditional average treatment effect for treated people. You subtract that from the untreated people. This is very tempting because it's very similar to all the equations we looked at at the beginning of the section where we want basically outcomes for treated people minus outcomes for untreated people. That's our causal effect. Um, the issue there though is um, we're missing out on confounding. So if we, if we just look at this, these are the people who were treated. So there's our 80, 75, 85, and 75, just the treated people. Divide by four, there's 78. Untreated people is gonna be our 60, 80, 100, and 80. That divided by four is gonna be 80. So it looks like you can just say 78 minus 80, you end up with negative 1.25. That is wrong because it's, again, not taking into account the selection bias. There are people who self-selected into treatment. We don't know exactly why they did it, but we can assume that it's in part because of age. And that's one of our nodes in the DAG saying that people are choosing the program because of age, so we need to account for that somehow. We can do that by figuring out the conditional average treatment effect for um, age or conditional average treatment effect based on age. And then we can do this formula that we saw back here. This gets us the correct average treatment effect. It still has treatment minus not treatment built into the equation here, but it's taking into account the age node in our DAG here. So this is very tempting and you might want to try this initially because you just say, oh, all the treated people minus all the untreated people figure it out. This only works if you're doing a randomized control trial and there's no selection bias and there are no nodes distorting the relationship between X and Y. If there are any nodes um, that are backdoors or any way confounding the relationship, then this is not going to work. Um, so here's back to our node um, diagram here. Um, we have age causing treatment and outcome. Um, we decided to use the old and young split there because we had the column that was observable and because we know that it is um, confounding that relationship. And so that's one way of statistically taking care of it. Um, this also only works if we assume unconfoundedness, which again means that treatment is randomly assigned inside these age groups. Um, that the one 
old person that didn't do the program just happened to not do it and somebody else may have happened to not do it. The one young person who did the program, that was just random. Other young people may have accidentally or accidentally done the program. Um, that's kind of the assumption we have to make for this to work. Um, so let's do another example of this. Um, this is from your Mastering Metrics reading on uh, regression that you did a couple sessions ago. Um, you had this table in there, um, table 2.1, and what this is what this table lets us do is answer this question here. Does attending a private university cause an increase in earnings? If we want to write that using do calculus language, we would say the expected value or the expectation of earnings given that you do private university. That's going to be the formula we work with. Um, this is all observational data. We do not know what would have happened had students been or had students gone to different schools. Uh, the way we read this, it's kind of a confusing um, table here. Um, student one applied to three different schools. They applied to two different private schools, um, Leafy and Smart University. They also applied to a public university. They were admitted to two of the schools, um, Smart Private and Tall State Public. They were rejected from Leafy. And so we know they're... Um, their admission decisions, um, those are highlighted in gray here, and we know their application decisions. So all three of these students, students one, two, and three, applied to the same schools, got rejected from the same schools, um, but this person went to a public school, these two people went to a private school. Um, and so that's the, the economists here called these people group A because they're very similar. They went to all, they applied to all the same schools, got accepted to the same schools, but made slightly different decisions. Um, group B, same thing. You have, they applied to three different schools. They got admitted to all three of those schools, um, but student four went to a private school. Student five went to a public school. Um, and that keeps going. They have C and D. They had a whole bunch of other groups that they had. This is just an, an excerpt from nine different students in their data set. This last column here shows their earnings um, years after they graduate from, from their college. So given this data, we can start trying to calculate the average treatment effect of attending a private university on earnings. The tempting thing to do would be find out the average earnings for people who went to private schools and subtract the earnings from people who went to public schools and figure out the difference and call that the causal effect. This is what you would do for that. Um, you just find the average for private schools. So that's gonna be um, 110, 100, um, 60, 115, and 75. So those, all, those are all our private school people. Um, the public school people were 110, 30, 90, and 60. So if we add those up, we're left with um, 72 for the public people, 92 for the private people, or 92,000, 72,500. And so you're left with this. And you say, that is our treatment effect. Going to a private university causes you to earn $18,000, $19,000 more in income. Um, this is wrong because it does not take into account confounding student characteristics. This is just assuming that this was a randomly assigned um, college decision. Um, maybe there was a randomized control trial. If it really was an RCT, then neat, then we can call this the causal effect, but it's not. Um, right here, the difference between person two and person three, they went to applied to the same schools, but this person went to a private school, this person went to a public school, something made that happen. Um, and there's some selection bias built into here. So we can't do this. As tempting as that feels, um, it doesn't work. So instead, we have to um, draw out the DAG or try to match these different groups on something that makes them similar. So one way of doing that, let's get rid of the drawings, is we might have a DAG that looks like this. Um, there's some sort of student characteristics um, or what the authors of the study called group um, that causes you to go to a private university and causes you to have specific income. Um, they didn't specify what exactly these student characteristics were. It could be parental income, it could be um, experience, work experience, service experience, um, 
aptitude for taking tests, a whole bunch of different things. The way they find this group and the way they identify this group in their data set is by matching students according to where they applied and where they got accepted and where they got rejected. So what researchers were able to say is this group one here, you have these three different students, they all chose to apply to the same three schools and they all got accepted and rejected from the same three schools. Um, and two of them chose to go to a private school and one of them chose to go to a public school. Um, but they're all pretty much essentially the same based on these student characteristics. Same thing with group B. They applied to the same three schools um, and then two of one went to a private school, one went to a public school, but essentially they are roughly the same type of person based on these student characteristics. So if we talk about the unconfoundedness assumption here, that just means that student one, two, and three, they're, they're the same type of person. The decision to choose private versus public was basically random. That's the unconfoundedness assumption. Is within group A, it was a random choice. Within group B, they got accepted to the same schools. The, the fact that student four went to private and student five went to a public, that was basically random. If we make that assumption, then we can do our magical um, formula, figuring out the conditional average treatment effect for the two groups and combining those to get the estimated average treatment effect. Okay, so this is what we do to do that. So if you remember our fancy formula here, if we can, if, if we believe in unconfoundedness, this is one way of statistically taking care of our, um, the, the confounding that comes from being in these different groups. So we have different chunks of this equation that we have to find. We want to find the conditional average treatment effect for people in group A. We want to find the conditional average treatment effect for people in group B. We want to find the proportion of people in group A and the proportion of people in group B. Again, pi here does not mean 3.14, it means percentage. So we can figure out each of these um, units in this um, equation here by using just this data here. So for the conditional average treatment effect of people in group A, the way we figure that out is we say um, we're just looking at group A, so we want except where we want the private people and we want the public people. Subtract those and that gives us the conditional average treatment effect. So this 110 and the 100, that comes from these two people who went to private school. Their average income is $105,000. And then we subtract that from, or we subtract the average um, public income for people in group A. And so we're left with negative $5,000. So what this means is for people in group A, it looks like attending a private school is actually worse for your income. Um, I don't believe that super strongly because it's based on three rows here, um, but that, that's how you would interpret it. Um, the conditional average treatment effect for group B then is this right here. We find the average um, effect or the average income for people who went to a private school, which in this case, the average is just that because there's only one, um, minus 30, um, and that's gonna be right there. And again, it's just one, so we don't need to divide by anything. Um, and the difference there is $30,000. So what that means is for people in group B, it looks like going to private school boosts your income by a lot, by like $30,000. Um, finally, once we have this, the conditional average treatment effect for group A and for group B, we can plug those into this bigger equation, figure out the proportions of group A versus the whole group and group B versus the whole group, and then multiply it out, and then we're left with a number. So here's our negative 5,000. Um, here's our 30, we found those. Next, we want the proportions. So here's our three out of five, and here's our two out of five, um, because three-fifths of this group is group A and two-fifths is group B. Multiply all of that together, add it, and we're left with $9,000. That is our estimated average treatment effect. It is not as wrong as what we did before. Um, before, just saying um, people who went to private minus people who went to public, the estimation there was like almost $20,000. Um, but once we take the student characteristics into account, we're left with a much smaller number. It's only 9,000 now instead of 19,000. 
Um, and it's arguably less wrong. We still don't know if it's perfectly right. There's no way of knowing that um, because we, again, can't read people's minds. But this gets us closer to the average, the actual population level average treatment effect, which we were able to do by accounting for group characteristics, which is kind of magical. Um, another way of doing this that um, was in the chapter that you read for Mastering Metrics, the reason that was in the regression chapter is you can use regression instead of this conditional average treatment effect stuff to account for these group characteristics. Um, so what this looks like here is you can do an equation like this. You can do a model where you're going to predict earnings based on whether or not they went to a private school and the group they're in, group A versus group B. So if you had this data set in R, it would look something like this. You're going to make a model here named model earnings. Um, you're going to use the linear model function. You're going to say earnings is explained by private. This column is just going to say private versus not private. Um, and group A, meaning if you're in group A or not group A. And assuming we have a data set called schools small. Um, so if we run this model, what it looks like if so schools small is basically the these five rows here is what I stuck in the data set. Um, so what we're left with actually it's all nine rows. So what we're really comparing the reason it's going to be slightly different is we're saying group A is these three and not group A are these six. So the proportions are going to be slightly different. It's going to be three, not three over five, but three over nine and six over nine instead of two over five. So it's going to be slightly different, but we're using the whole data set now instead of just A and D. So this is what the results would look like from that regression. Um, the coefficient for private, notice how it is 10,000. That is the effect of going to a private school on your earnings. It should boost your earnings by $10,000 is what this model says. Um, this number here, that is the effect of being in group A. That just means if you're a group A student, on average, your income will be $60,000 higher just because you're in group A. Um, this intercept here means if you go to a public school and you're not in group A, that's kind of the baseline income that is predicted by the model. It's going to be $40,000. So if you go to a private school, that boosts your income by $10,000. That's the switch that we've been talking about when we talk about regression. So flipping that switch up has a causal effect of $10,000 on your income. Um, so that is the coefficient we care about. It's also less wrong than that $19,000 that we, we guessed initially just by saying um, average for treatment minus average for uh, control or average private minus average public. Um, so this gets us a better number because Again, we're accounting for group differences. We're dealing with that confounding that comes from the DAG so that we can isolate the effect of X on Y. Um, the other advantage of doing regression versus um, this here, this just gives us a single number. Um, this is the estimated average treatment effect, but we don't know what the standard errors are for that. We don't know any significance information. If we do regression, though, um, we have 10,000, that's our estimate, but we also know the standard error. And we know if it's significant, that p-value is 0.5, which means there's a 50% chance of seeing a $10,000 effect in a world where there is no effect. Um, so is that really a true effect that we've measured? We don't know. Um, we have no way of telling if we're in the fake world where there's no effect or if we're in a real world where there's no effect. There's no way of telling the difference. But we can actually see that because we have the reported p-value. Back with this, we have no p-value. We don't know um, what the probability of seeing that is in a world where there's no difference. So that is um, how you can use this whole potential outcomes framework to calculate causal effects based on data that doesn't come from like time machines. This is just observational data that, we've, that we see. Um, but if you can account for the confounding influences, in this situation, group differences, um, in other situations, in, in the other example we looked at age, that was a confounder, we deal with that somehow statistically, um, either through regression or inverse probability weighting or matching, which we'll get to, um, or doing the combination of the conditional average treatment effects, which is what we did here. If we can deal with it statistically somehow, that closes that back door and we're left with just the actual average treatment effect.
which is again magical and underneath all of this what's really happening is that do operator that we have so we're saying what is the effect of of private school on earnings given that you do a private school um, we don't have control over who does private school but we can if we close that back door by accounting for group characteristics that lets us rewrite the equation without the do part and we're left with just observational data which then tells us the causal effect and so we can combine this whole potential outcomes framework with DAGs and find actual causal effects from observational data.